I'm going to take the prayer at the start. Well, good morning, church, and welcome to our, our worship hour. We wanted to start acknowledging the pain that is being suffered in Israel and in Palestine today. We, uh, we are prayers are for the people of Israel. They're also for the innocents that are in Palestine. Please remember that not everybody in Palestine is a member of Hamas or a sympathizer with Hamas, but that Hamas has interwoven themselves in there using a lot of Palestinian Christians and innocents as human shields. War is always awful. It is always waged by the people who don't pay the cost. And that is, that's heartbreaking. So our prayers are not for war. Our prayers are not for victories. Our prayers are for God to settle these things and protect the innocents. And that's how we will pray. Let's begin with the prayer. Father, our heart is broken with the families in Israel who were suddenly awoken yesterday morning by Kalashnikovs, kidnapping, slaughter, the abuse of corpses, the taking of hostages. Our hearts are with the more than 40 women, already young women, already identified as being taken alive and deep into the Palestinian territory. Father, we don't believe that nations are evil, but we know that people within them can be evil and bring down great pain to all others. We do not pray for teams in war. What we pray for is that your mercy will protect the innocents, that you will turn back evil men, because it always seems to be men, and that you will thwart the devil's desires in this, and that you will bring peace to Israel, to Palestine, and to the world. Father, somehow, while this storm rages, help us to be faithful, keep our eyes and our hearts open, and our wallets and our pockets open, and our homes open, to serve as places of comfort and care for those in pain. Be with us, Father, and be with those people who are so dear to you and to us. In the name of Jesus, the whole church says, Amen. Amen.
Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou my inheritance, now and always. Thou and thou only be first in my heart. My King of heaven, my Good morning. Um, I'm Mary Alice, and this is Jaime. And um, I guess I confess a little bit that giving is like the one thing that I'm asked to do that makes me a little nervous. Like, it it just really does. And um, I think that that is because for many years, if I had a Facebook status with church, it would have been, it's complicated or on again, off again, maybe. Um, I love Jesus. I came to know Jesus a long time ago, and I I love Jesus. Um, But church was kind of hard. So this week, I had this moment when I'm driving in my car, and one of my favorites is Don Williams. I love Don Williams. But my favorite song, the chorus is, I pray for a stronger back. I pray for a bigger heart. I pray for the will to keep on walking when the way is dark. I follow that winding road, just trying to stay on track. I don't pray for a lighter load. I pray for a stronger back. And I was driving, and I've heard this song a thousand times, and for this, this one time, this church and these faces came to my head. Like, I know where Patrick was this week. I know what he was doing. I know what we do I know what this small staff here does. We agree on Jesus and to spread love and to spread the word of Jesus. I have no hesitations asking that if there are ways out there that you can help strengthen our collective back, please do. Send videos, send devotionals, um, Give to your people around you, support your community, love your people. But if you've got something to help us spread this message, that would be great too. Um, you can do that by. Jaime, do you want to go there? Okay. Uh, there are different ways to give. You got um, on the website, Bill Pay, PayPal, and the just regular way to give it, write a check to our PO box, or you can do also estate planning. Let us pray. God, please give us a heart of love for Jesus and his sheep. Holy Spirit, show us how to be people that feed Jesus' sheep. Give us the strength we need to be obedient to your calling. We pray that our giving will result in the advancement of your kingdom here on earth. We know how you can transform lives Help us use the resources we're given to reach the lost in our communities and throughout the world. 
Amen. Just a day or so ago, I noticed on social media that Patrick had put this out there. Let me read it to you. People often ask if God exists. We believe that he does. Yet, what kind of God exists? And why would God make humans? Does God plan everything ahead of time? Or is he taking a risk? with this whole creation thing. And then he invites you all and us to join him today. And I'm glad we're here. We remember Jesus at this time in the communion. And we remember the sacrifice that he made for us all. There are things we don't understand, but we accept on faith. He was fully human, so he died. He was fully God, so he was raised and is with us now. We believe that God exists and that he's made a way for us to live with him eternally. Simple things that he's encouraged us to do. Just believe. Just be baptized. Just go under the water. And then remember to serve and to love, and to put Jesus first. We do simple things like this communion, and we'll do that now together. Let's pray for the bread. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your willingness that we can come to you in simple terms, Yet so profound is the result, a home in heaven with you. We thank you now for the method that you made that we can have our sins forgiven. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his sacrifice. And we take this bread now in remembrance of his body. In Christ's name I pray.
Amen. Now let's pray for the Jews. Father, in like manner, we recognize that through your grace again, we have our sins forgiven, and the blood of Christ wipes away all of our sins. We thank you for that method. We thank you for that forgiveness. We thank you most for your grace. As we drink this juice, help us to remember Christ's blood given as a sacrifice for our sins. In Christ's name I pray, amen. amen. I'll be reading from Isaiah 46, 8 through 13. Remember this, keep it in mind, take it to heart, you rebels. Remember the former things, those of long ago, I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say, my purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please. From the east, I summon a bird of prey. From a far off land, a man to fulfill my promise. What I have said, that I will bring about. What I have planned, that I will do. Listen to me, you stubborn hearted. You who are now from far from righteousness, I am bringing my righteousness near. It is not far away, and my salvation will not be delayed. I will grant salvation to Zion, my splendor to Israel. Well, hello, church, again. We're so glad to have you here. At least half of our local team is away this week, but we got flooded in with visitors from out of town. And that always makes us happy. And for some of you, it's your first time here. For some of you, your old hands are coming back now. This is your place. They've already marked out where they want to put their bed and, and arrange the furniture. Uh, but truly, welcome home to all of you. And you are always welcome to come visit us if you're in the Middle Tennessee area. Just let us know. You can send us a note at info at rsafeharbor.com, and we'll tell you how to make that happen. All right? Um, Again, we mentioned, if you're just tuning in for the sermon and you're wondering, well, why didn't we mentioned Israel as the opening of the worship and we had a prayer for them and also for the innocents that are being used as human shields by Hamas and by Hezbollah. Hezbollah launched attacks from the north today as we figured they would. So our prayer is that God's will and power will move in and bring peace. So you can refer back to that uh, little discussion and prayer earlier. Uh, we also want to just say thank you. I have so much up here, actually, the day. Uh, we we kind of need me to have a command desk like a, a Captain Kirk or something. <laughs> For anybody under 50, um, that was a TV show. All right, let's move on. Just we, we get cards sometimes and little notes. Bless this gift wherever it's needed most. That comes from Leander, Texas. We don't normally do this. But I just want to let you see, we get these, and it means so much. Um, we have somebody who gave and said, post-dated checks for the rest of the year. Well, that's a lot of faith in us. Thank you, and you're very kind. And that comes from Port Orchard, Washington, and I saw them check in today. So hi, guys. Um, also, hi to Epaphras, who checked in from Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. He checks in every week. His students are getting these notes, and he is just amazing. And I do plan to go to see him sometime next year. So we're trying to figure out how to make that work. I told my doctor I was too old, too weak, and on too many meds to go. And he said, you're not on that many meds. Go. So <laughs> if anybody has a, a, a recommendation for a new doctor, um, no, no I'll, I'll go. But again, many heartfelt thanks, praises, blessings to all of you who make this possible. When you come to the, the soundstage, you will notice a couple things. One, it's beautiful, it's wonderful. It is far beyond anything that you see on the camera, is it not? It just kind of blows you away when you walk in. And the hospitality of the people who own this to us is mind-boggling. Um, it's just a, truly a gift of God that we were brought together. Uh, but you will also... Notice that it is a tiny team that does this here. And I've had people say, well, Middle Tennessee, you know, why, you know, a lot of people go to church there. Why won't they go here? One is that we don't try to steal sheep. 
But we just say, if you want to come, you can. Most people are still comfortable bolting us on. They go to a brick and mortar every now and then, uh, maybe even every week, but then they bolt us on. And if you watch the numbers, very few of our platforms give us good numbers because they don't like giving you that. Uh, but if you watch the numbers on those that do, you'll see that they surge in the afternoon and the evening of Sunday and all through Monday and Tuesday morning because that's people are bolting us on. And we're, you're always welcome. You are always welcome. We love having you here. That said, let's get to work. We have some theology to do today and more theological terms next week. We are not going to hand out milk all the time. Uh, there are going to be times where you're going to need to do a little bit of thinking. And oh, by the way, thank you, all of those of you who have listened to the deep dives, and those numbers are way up, and who are commenting on it, and those that are saying you're listening for the third time. Well, after a while, if you keep listening, you, you start developing an accent, so you might want to, to space it just a, a wee bit. But here's a, here's a bit of theology for you. When we talk about the fact that God bends to us and that prophecies are often conditional, we very often get rapid and severe pushback from the two largest camps of Protestants, that is the Calvinist and the Arminians. To review, the Calvinists believe that every single thing that has ever happened or that ever will happen, even down to the spin of a particular atom or the death of a particular star, was planned and designed by God before the creation of the world. And when they say everything, they mean everything. John Piper is perhaps the leading preacher in the Calvinist tradition here. I wouldn't say the leading theologian, although he certainly is leading. There are other theologians out there. Um, but he has a megachurch, and he has a megaphone, and he writes books that are just gobbled up, especially by millennials, who seem to be flocking to the comfort of Reformed theology. This is a quote from his book. And also, he, he did an inter interview. He posted a video. He did this on purpose. The video is called Desiring God. And then there's a subtitle, How Could God Kill Women and Children? This is a quote. It is right for God to slaughter women and children anytime he pleases. God gives life and he takes life. Everybody who dies, dies because God wills that they die. You ever wonder why the message of Jesus isn't getting through to your neighbors? Do you ever wonder why when we sing God is love? A whole lot of people doubt that. It's not just judgmental Christians. It's the official doctrine that some of them are teaching. But it, Calvin himself burned Michael Servetus, who was a, um, a theologian who had a different idea. And Calvin said, we have to kill him because that's what God would want to keep the church pure. Um, what kind of God are you worshiping? In fact, I must tell you that whenever atheists tell me that they don't believe in God... And they can tell me that because I don't ridicule them. I don't attack them. I always go, okay. In fact, I don't even push. But if they want more than just that sentence, they're, they're actually in a conversation. I'll say, can you tell me something about what you know about God? Without exception, it is, it's never happened to me. I'll be 67 in a couple of months. This is never, there's never an exception. The kind of God they describe when they're done, I'll say, oh, I don't believe in that God either. And they, they look at me. Now, this does not result in the standard preacher stories where they rush me to the baptistry and we baptize tens of thousands. Some are intrigued. Some look into it further. Some do not. Because that's the way the seed works. Remember the parable of the sower? But the God that is being portrayed is not even the God that we find in Scripture. Arminians who follow a guy named Jacob or Jacob, Arminius, <clears throat> said that humans have some free will. And I don't know of anybody who believes we have total free will. You know, as I've said before, we are locked out of some options by our genetics, by where we were born, and by when we were born. 
So if you were born in, in 1820 and you wanted to be an airline pilot, you couldn't be. You get the point? We are limited you know, um, in, in some form. But they believe we have some free will and that God takes our agency. When we use the word agency, that means our ability to do and change things, to make an impression, to spin left, spin right, to push out, to pull back. That's agency. And that God takes that into account. But whenever we talk about God being open, it upsets both camps. Why? Well, the Calvinists insist, as one of their early teachers in, in America, Jonathan Edwards said, quote, God's knowledge of future actions, human actions and decisions demonstrates that there is no such thing as libertarian freedom. Everything has been written and decided. It cannot and will not be changed. And again, we've talked about that kills all evangelism. Why? It's been sorted. That kills all charitable works. Why? It's already been determined. Well, Arminians say that we do have freedom in action and decision, but that God pre-knows everything we're going to act and decide. Most people, by the way, if you nail them down, you're going to find out it's kind of hard because they're a little Arminian and they're a little Calvinist. Well, let's talk. Here's the thing that both sides often ignore. Prophecies aren't all the same. Boom, period. Some are statements of what God intends to do in the future. And if God's will is the only condition required by the prophecy, then it's going to happen. If God says, I will this, it's, and I'm going to do this, well, then it's going to happen. No question. What God says he will do when the prophecy is separated from humans, he will do. An example would be in Isaiah 46, 10 and 11. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times what is still to come. I say my purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please. From the east, I summon a bird of prey. From a far off land, a man to fulfill my purpose. What I've said, that I will bring about. What I have planned, that I will do. Now, Calvinists will often use this as an example saying, see, that settles the question. And I'll say, no, he's speaking of him. We're never mentioned at all. But there are other prophecies that are human. Well, there's human involvement. They're conditional. God can prophesy on evidence supplied to him. For example, he told Moses that Pharaoh would reject his offer because he had a deep understanding of Pharaoh's heart. God didn't make Pharaoh fail. God knew it was going to happen because he knew Pharaoh. Think about this. We can do that too. We see somebody stumbling out of a bar, barely able to walk, and walking around with the key fob trying to find their car, and then getting in, and we're going, that's, there's going to be an accident. Well, that's, you're not being a prophet there. You're not determining the future. We can just tell, based on the evidence, this is a bad thing. Well, a lot of scriptures, however, a lot of prophecies in scripture, have God saying, I will do this, and then there's a big word, massive word. You might need to write this down, check the spelling. If. If. If, it's a lot, there's a lot of ifs in scripture. God intends to do this if certain conditions are met. These are called conditional prophecies. You've probably not heard the term because we tend in sermons to, to you know, there's this big, massive, great lake of information in scripture and most sermons are skipping a rock over parts of it. You just get a little bit, but we got to go a bit deeper here if we're going to be able to deal with the problem of evil, which is the last sermon in October, the first sermon in November. Yeah, we do plan way out. Um, we're actually going somewhere. Wow. Okay. If we look at one end, um, at, at, we looked at one at the, rather, at the end of the lesson last week. If we look at Jeremiah 18, that, that's just kind of a compact Reader's Digest view. In Jeremiah 18, he repeatedly says, these prophecies of mine will come to pass if this, but they will not if that. And all of the ifs are based upon human agency. Whether we agree to work with him or not. Whether we change our ways or not. It's all up to us. It's a binary choice. Now, most of us know what binary is because we're in the computer age and we know that 
zeros and ones. Those are your binary choice. Well, they didn't know anything about binary. So God would say, I hold before you life or death. Blessings or punishment. And he let them choose. Now think about this. He says, I hold before you life and death or similar dichotomies. If we do not have free choice, then God is playing with us and cruelly so. It would be like saying, if you do such and such, there will be cake. But knowing there is no cake, that would be cruel. You know, if it's broccoli, not so cruel. Cake is cruel. The lack of cake is, is a plague upon the land, frankly. So that if there is no ifs in the prophecies of God, but God says there are ifs, what does that say about the character of God and his trustworthiness? The, I, I know that Calvinists believe that they are putting God up high, exalted, and all-powerful, but you're actually making him cruel and untrustworthy. Because he says things, and there are, there are things like David's throne will be established forever. It lasted just two and a half kings. And you might say, I hear people say, he's going to reestablish. We don't have the records. We have no idea who's in the line of David. 70 AD happened. The, the fall of Jerusalem, the ruin of the records happened. The diaspora happened. So let's be very plain. There are times that God acts upon the world on his own, but more often we find him working with his creatures. And you may, may not have noticed this. His creatures are not entirely predictable at all. In Jeremiah 3, verse 7, just one, just one example here. I, this is God speaking. In fact, if you take a look at, um, in most versions... It'll have the word Lord all capitalized, which means it's the tetragrammaton, the four consonants that consist, that, that, that make up God's name, the unpronounceable name, that we tend to say Yahweh. We used to call Jehovah, but now they say Yahweh. So this is him speaking. I thought that after she had done all of this, talking about Israel, she would return to me, but she did not. And her unfaithful sister Judah saw it. Was God lying? Or was he truly surprised and frustrated by decisions we were being, that were made here? I know, for some people, this shakes them. And they say, this diminishes God. I'd remind them of the illustrations I used a couple of weeks ago about the non-existence of the future and how God is much, much larger, wiser, and stronger, and more loving if the future doesn't exist until it does, until all the possibilities collapse into one certainty, or what we usually use the term singularity in science. There is ample evidence in Scripture that God planned to save everybody. Everybody. God planned to send Jesus to us, planned for the good news to be spread and lived upon the earth. There's also ample evidence that God chose certain people, certain times to work with him to carry out his will. Every single person he picked was very faulty, but God bent down and worked with them as he works with us. The character of David most, in most David's stories is not good. And, and I know that we always like to do the you know, pretty little David and the sheep and, you know, hey, he killed Goliath and yay, yay team David. But there was also rape, there was adultery, there was treachery. He was a traitor, he was a murderer, he was lazy, he was horrible to his kids. I, we can keep going on. Now, God still was able to use him to advance his will and even to get some pretty psalms out of them. But are you trying to tell me that God decided the course of David's life? That would make God a co-conspirator. You know, we do that. If you say, right, we're going to walk in this, this bank, we're going to rob it, I need you to hold the sack, and I do that, I'm a co-conspirator. Or even if I know you're going to do it, and I don't tell, I'm guilty of being an accessory before the fact. Um, you making God guilty? Think about this. How about this? 
interesting, isn't it, that those who most often firmly state that God's will is always done and God's plans always come to fruition, ignore the passages that say God is not willing that any should perish. Ask a Calvinist, are we all saved? No, no, no. In fact, they don't believe Jesus died for everybody. They say Jesus died only for the elect, only for those predetermined. Now think of, think of this. Only those chosen before creation to be saved did Jesus die for. My question is why? If they were already chosen to be saved, what was the point? What did it change? It's rather like, I'm going to age myself again here, Indiana Jones, the first movie. The first movie. Watch it, and I'm going to ruin it for you now. Not a single thing Indy does changes the course of anything in the story. He never bumps it off course. He's a non-factor in the story. And if those of you are going, I have it, just go watch it. All we do is get to watch a guy in a story, but he doesn't change the story in any bit at all. Why would you send Jesus if he'd made no changes? Opened no doors, closed no doors, changed nothing in the story. That makes zero sense. Or how about this? The Bible says Jesus died for the sins of the world. And you say, no, only for these. Well, I'm sorry, but I, if I have a choice laid before me, binary, who to choose, I'll go with God on this and on everything else. The fact is a prophecy and the will of God is a much more complicated and changeable thing than one might assume if one listens to predestinationists. Richard Rice says, quote, the fact that God foreknows or predestines something does not guarantee that it will happen. The fact that God determines part of history does not mean that he determines all of history. And the fact that God extends a specific call to certain people does not mean that he similarly calls all people. What does that mean? It means we learn to, as Paul would put it, rightly divide the word of truth. A couple days ago, it rained. That was actually a significant event in Middle Tennessee. We are nothing like the, you people who have been suffering in Texas and elsewhere with extreme drought. But we were dry. And the rains came and the winds blew. And uh, I looked out and, and I, in fact, I had even decided to take the next day off and golf with a friend. And we called each other and went, no. But as we watched the river running through my yard, there's a river that runs through my yard. The people who designed our development decided I needed an occasional river. <laughs> so as, as the river ran through, I didn't say, well, you know what the Bible says, I need to build an ark made of gopher wood. <laughs> because that doesn't apply to me. By the way, some of the promises don't either. When God says to Jeremiah, I know my thoughts concerning you, to bless you, not to curse you, we often appropriate that for us, don't we? He was talking to Jeremiah, who died doing what he didn't want to do. He said, don't take me to Egypt. They took him to Egypt forcefully. We don't know that he made it to Egypt because he vanishes from history on the trip. God had thoughts that didn't mean that humans couldn't frustrate it. Will, they, will humans win? No, because God has predetermined that he wins. We do have to wonder what Every now and then, you need to go to a mirror, look and see if you're wearing the right team's jersey. That's all. Because it's easy to get the wrong jersey on. My wife and I are soccer fans, for those of you in the rest of the world, football. Um, and every time we go to one, my wife, being a thoughtful person, says, what are the colors of the other team? We don't want to wear those. <laughs> well, in America, that's just kind of a nice thing. In Britain, wearing the wrong colors gets you killed. Um, well, maybe not killed, but thumped. Um, because you've never, everybody knows British soccer fans are the best behaved. <laughs> there were times in Glasgow where we just decided not, we're just going to stay home today because we don't own anything that says, I don't root for either team, right? What team do you root for? Check your jersey. It was 
John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, that looked at George Whitfield, a Calvinist, and said, your God is my devil. And I understand why. By the way, knowing these things also helps us with another problem. Many have. They'll say, why is there evil in the world and a loving God who has all power and wisdom exist? Again, we deal with this a lot in the last sermon in November and the first, I'm sorry, last sermon in October, first in November. But the answer is, very simply, God is working with us and we often choose evil. That's why. It's not a complete answer because it does not actually answer for tsunamis, cystic fibrosis, cancer, other natural disasters, but it does answer a lot. Think of it this way. My wife and I were blessed with two amazing children, born six years apart. We would have liked more kids, God said too, and he gave us great kids. And they're not kids now, but they're still kids to us. Our daughter was our firstborn. She's always, always been intelligent, beautiful, witty, and very strong. Having a beautiful daughter causes you some worries. Does it not? Having a beautiful daughter can make your life a little frightening as you don't know what's, what's the world going to do with her. We could have made sure that she would come to adulthood never having touched alcohol, drugs, never having sex outside of marriage, never getting even a speeding ticket. All we'd have to do is chain her in the basement. Is there anybody on the planet who thinks that's good parenting? To be a parent, you have to risk. You have to allow them to risk. When our son signed into the Marine Corps, being a parent, we knew that could happen. We also knew we might not get him back. We did. Spoiler alert. But not everybody does, do they? It's a risk. I had peop- I'm supposed to be in Israel here in just a couple of weeks. People have said, are you still going? If they're flying, I'm going. It won't be the first time. Somebody asked me yesterday, they said, why? I said, I, I did live just outside Detroit for 10 years. Um, and that was when it was bad. Detroit's getting so much better now. They've had some good mayors. I'm so happy for Detroit. We loved it. We loved it, by the way. We had a grand time there. Fantastic. But, um, you know, it was beautiful, you know, when the gangs came out with their new colors. And, but it, the, the, it was the only place I've ever lived where I've used the phrase, cover me, I'm going for milk. But <laughs> it's better now. People say, well, won't that be risky? I got to tell you something. I drive in Nashville. That's pretty risky. Because I'm sure most people in Middle Tennessee got their driving license by mail. They took a course, a correspondence course, and had not actually found, seen an actual car until they got in one. But, and by the way, if you have extra, we have a critical lack of blinker fluid here. <laughs> Nobody's blinkers work. We need more fluid. Now, I say that, and then I've been in other countries where their traffic makes ours look like nothing. So if you're in one of those, sorry, sorry, my heart does bleed for you. Here's the thing. It was never an option to eliminate risk. It was never an option to lock her down in a basement. To give your heart to someone is to risk every single time. To give your heart to someone is to open yourself up to pain, rejection, heartache, fear. Your first plan will most not likely not survive. Neither will your second. Why? Because it isn't entirely up to you. The universe gets a vote. The people around you get a vote. You may decide that you're a singing star. And you're not. You may decide you're a social influencer. But if you've only got five followers, you're not. It is... It is also true in religion. I've spoken to elders, one of them in, in particular I'm thinking of now, that tried hard to run his church a certain way. And he was the chief elder, although he, nobody would say that out loud. And as I used to, I used to fly around working with church leaderships and still would if somebody needed me to, and I had the time. Um, but working with this one guy, he had this one project 
And he said, I'm, and these people, I've been working for a year and I can't get anybody to join me. And I leaned over and I said, then you're not a shepherd. And he looked at me and he says, yes, I am. And I said, where's your flock? If you have no sheep, do we really need to go through the syllogisms here? Do we need to walk through the logic pattern here? If they're not following you, well, he wanted to, I said, no, no, what you are is a herdsman, ineffective. But a herdsman, you're trying to drive sheep. You can't drive sheep. You try, they just part. It is so frustrating. You can't drive them. You have to lead them. God made a tremendous risk, a, a, just a tremendous risk when he made us in his image. He had the choice. He could have made us. He could have not made us. He made us in his image, beings that have choice. He did not risk his character. He did not risk his righteousness. He risked his heart. Scripture is full of pictures of a heartbroken God. I ask you to go back and look at the sermon I did on Hosea. All of our videos are up there. It's well over 500 now. Or you can find it everywhere where God hurts, uh, God grieves. How about Ephesians? We'll just do one. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. We know that verse? We know that verse. We've heard that verse. How can you grieve him if he always knew it and it was in his plan? That makes sense. But do children ever grieve their parents? All of them do. By the way, right now, if you're feeling insulted, do parents ever grieve their children? All of them do. When you love, you put that to risk. It's amazing, isn't it? God could have withdrawn. But Jesus said, I would spread my wings if, you'll gather, if you will gather. He said, but you wouldn't. I would have, but you wouldn't. Not in my eternal plan. It was decided, none of that. None of that fake, lofty sounding pseudo Christianity. We are walking with God and it is risky. Our God does not stay uninvested. He does not stay at a safe distance. Our God does not worry about his honor. Our God wades into the middle of us and works with us and for us. I have friends, I've had friends through the years that work with preschool, kindergarten or such. And I'll talk to them um, and say, well, your first few years, you got every cold node in a man, didn't you? And they'll say, yes. And I'll say, how many years was it before you stopped being sticky? <laughs> when you wade right into the middle of these little ones and love them, you're going to get sticky. I've been hugged by kids before I got up to give a major speech at a major event and have peanut butter and all sorts of things on me. Because for some reason, the kids said, that looks like somebody who wants a hug. Uh, they, they were wrong. <laughs> but I accepted the hug, and I was grateful, and I felt that it was an honor. And then I, I, I could eat off my shirt. Um, it's risky. We're not dealing with an unapproachable God. We're, we're dealing with a God that has a human face, who is not indifferent to us. And that helps us answer that first important question. What kind of God created the world? An aloof monarch or a caring parent? We'll do the binary. A God who ensures his victory by locking down all dissenting voices and keeping all choices away from his children or a God who engages with his children and always from day one gives them the option, here's the tree, to reject him. From day one, says, you don't have to follow me. You do have the option of rejecting me. God cares so much about us that he lets what we do impact him. Our lives matter to him. Your life matters to God. Our decisions are truly significant. No wonder then that heaven is full of those who are actively cheering us on. You ever notice that? Scripture talks about this great cloud of witnesses. Why would you cheer a sporting event that is fixed and you know how it's going to end? There has to be something at risk, doesn't there? American baseball fascinates me. Not enough to watch it, but 
because, first of all, people that follow baseball in America are deeply involved in every route. You know, they'll say he has the best batting average of every left-handed person, 27 years old, with a mustache, from Philadelphia, <laughs> born in Indiana. I mean, they know all of this stuff. They have all the boxes. It's, it, it's, I guess it's some form of calculus or math game that involves spitting and scratching. That I've noticed that. But I have noticed one thing, and that is even the, the greatest Hall of Famer misses far more often than they hit. Christians are like that too. We're going to miss more than we hit. God knew that going in. He didn't fix the game. How boring would it be that every time you got up, you hit a home run? Even if they were trying not to pitch to you. I know I don't watch these games either, but I have noticed that some, for some reason, sometimes the catcher goes over there and they just throw back and forth a few times because they don't want to throw it to the guy. They just want him to walk to first base. It's a bizarre game. Uh, they use their hands. What kind of sport does that? But I mean, even then, you would just jump up, levitate, run over there and hit it. And home run. After a while, it would lose its novelty. It really would. After a while, you'd quit doing it. But he cares so much about us, he didn't fix the race. Therefore, in Hebrews, we'll, we'll close out with this. We're going to close out with this and an act of rebellion. I'll explain. Not now. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, by the way, that word, that term in Paul's day meant the spectators in a sporting event. So let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. What beautiful messages. There was a time, I don't remember a lot about my childhood. Um, a lot of reasons for that, but it's all right. I used to be a shrink, so I know them. Uh, but I do remember, and I could not have been older than four, that we were stateside. And we were at a Christian college of some sort. Since I'm not entirely sure, I'm not going to name it. But it seemed to be a missionaries conference of some sort. So that's why we were there. And my dad, I don't know where we were living at the time, but my dad was considering going to a new country. And he was really, really excited. So we went to the, the, the seminar. And he took the family, because you did, you, you know, we didn't have family to leave with because they weren't religiously acceptable to dad. So we went with us. We went with them, rather. And there was, I can remember, though, at night, there was no program for we kids. During the day, it was like daycare for me. I can remember that bit. But at night, you had to go hear the sermons. And they were angry men. They were angry. Something about liberalism, whatever that was, and acts at the root and the like. And I won't name all of the names. That's not the, the deal. But in this particular tribe, they had been using a songbook. I believe the songbook was tan, uh, like gospel songs or something like that. There was a blue book as well. But then a new book had come out, which was kind of red. I would even say wine colored, but we wouldn't approve of the word wine. So uh, a Cordovanish type of thing. And it had more songs in it. And, and they even had a song gum stickered in the back because they found a new one after they wrote it. That's where we got 728B. If those of you in the tribe know exactly what I'm talking about because they, they wrote it too late. So they went ha, ha, and stuck it in the back of that one. And because this tribe never changes anything for the next two hymnal issues, even though they had more songs, it was still listed as 728P. I'm going, you, you want other people to throw away their faith for, and you won't get rid of a bee. Fair enough. But I was four years old and I was frightened of the preachers. They were screaming about the dangers here and the like, and they'd go red faced and sweat would pop off of them. And one in particular melted in my brain. He, uh, 
was yelling about the new songbook and the unscriptural songs in the songbook. And one in particular made him just furious. And then he looked at the title on the book and said, Great Songs of the Church. And he screamed, What church? And he threw it to a chorus of amens. No applause in this particular track, but a chorus of amen. Yeah, there. And I'm just going. Later, I found out that it was two songs that they hated. One was, I come to the garden alone. But the other one was, my God and I. They hated a line in there that talks about God talking about the plans made for us when they were all but a a dim conception. Later, I'd grow up to be a fella who read physics and understood, yep, there is no future. There is only the now and what God has determined. And we are walking with him. And we are friends of God. We are the Kedeshim who will be with him in heaven. That's the name. We are the ones who laugh and talk with God. What kind of God made the world? What kind of God doesn't mind this song at all? Got so many papers up here. Let me get to the right paper. Because if I get the words wrong, Miss Kirsten will swoop down. <clears throat> as she should my God and I go in the field together we walk and talk as good friends should and do we clasp our hands our voices ring with laughter my God and I walk through Clasp our hands, our voices ring with laughter. My God and I walk through the meadows you. He tells me of the years that went before me, when heavenly plans were made for me to be. When all was bought, a dream of dim reflection to come to life's first verdant glory seed. When all was bought, a dream of dim reflection to come to life, first verdant glory seed. My God and I will go for right together. We'll walk and talk as good friends should and do. This earth will pass and with the common trifles. But God and I will go on in. earth will pass and with the common trifles my God and I will go unendingly the whole church says amen Amen. I've asked Greg to come up to close us out in prayer thank you Thank you, everybody, for joining us, whether it's live right now or you're catching us in the evening or in the next couple of days. Uh, you're part of us. You're part of our family. You're part of our group. And uh, you're always welcome here. Uh, I think of uh, the opening of our service here about an hour ago when Patrick was talking about Israel. And it's deep on many people's hearts what's going on over there. But at the same time, Afghanistan has been hit by a very bad earthquake the worst in recorded history for at least a good number of years. Over 2,000 people have died. And uh, it's kind of shadowed in the news because the news goes for the most sensational. So other things could be happening at the same time and we overlook them. Uh, But I want to just 
simply mentioned, there's a lot of hurt. Boy, there is so much hurt. And the news is going to tell us about all the big, big hurts. But there's hurts everywhere. Uh, There's hurts in many of homes, struggling marriages, teenagers that don't think their parents connect with them anymore. Uh, There's people that are crying, they're lonely. It's just a lot of hurt. And we want you to know, as a church, we care. We absolutely care. Don't hesitate in a heartbeat to reach out, send us a message, communicate with us. Let us know if there's anything we can do. Maybe we can pray for you or pray with you on the phone. We're not going to stick your name up on a screen or make any announcements. We'll keep it, we'll keep it as quiet as you like it to be. But let us be there for you. That's what a church family is about. It's to be there for each other. We're not trying to do this journey by ourselves. So, so let us help you if there's any way we can. Let's close in prayer. Father, we're so thankful for your goodness for your love, that even in all the hurts of this world, there are magnificent and wonderful things going on and answered prayers and just spectacular things happening, Father. We don't know about them so often. Father, may we grow in our faithfulness to you. May we grow in our curiosity for you. May we grow in our caring for each other. And we grow in our love for you. Oh, we praise your holy name. Amen. Amen. Go in peace.